I am the virtue of wisdom. My words give voice to those wise. I bring long life and its secrets, mysteries of the divine. My right hand raised to the high realms, my left is poised to the ground. I am the bridge to the heavens, my voice like a trumpet sound. La 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 Hello and welcome to Hermetic Journeys. I'm your host, Tony G. And that was my daughter, Anna. And she is, has an amazing voice, I think you'll agree. I mean, yeah, am I biased? Well, sure, I'm her dad. But she has a great voice. I mean, absolutely. And I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Okay. Now, here we are. Emblem 26. Wow, Adelina Fugans. We're past the halfway point. Can you believe it? God, we started almost four years ago. In any case... Uh, if you haven't subscribed in all that time, if you've been watching, or if you just tuned in, hey, subscribe, right? It doesn't cost you anything. Also remember that we have a Hermetic Journeys merch, all right, which is uh, hermeticjourneys.com slash shop, okay? Pretty easy to remember, right? Check out some of the merch, like this really exciting t-shirt that I'm wearing, and caps caps, and, and, and hoodies and all that stuff, so go on and check that out. All right, let's get to this. Emblem 26. Let's take a look at the emblem. This is one of my favorite emblems because it's just so beautiful and simple. Let's see what the motto says. The motto says, the tree of life is the fruit of human wisdom. Okay, well, that's absolutely beautiful. So the tree of life, well, wait a minute. So is that the tree of life as in the Garden of Eden tree of life? I'm assuming it is, right? Or Sapientia, Whoops, that's her name. <laughs> she is Sapientia. She represents wisdom. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was going to reveal that a little later on. But she represents wisdom. Well, let's read the epigram and see what else, what other spoilers I can ruin for you. Here we go. Uh, to, to greater wisdom man cannot attain than health and wealth to acquire, if not in vain. She in her right hand length of days extends, in her left vast heaps of treasure comprehends. To him that shall espouse her as a wife, she, as the tree, will yield the fruit of life. All right, so what do these banderoles inscribed in Latin say? Let's check that out. In her right hand is the phrase, Longitudo dierum et sanitas, which when translated means length of days and health. And in her left hand is, Gloria ac divitae infinitae, honor and rich and infinite riches now this is taken from proverbs 316 the biblical text where solomon is talking about wisdom right and, and and it says here length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor says so proverbs 316 so michael meyer has literally uh, embodied wisdom in the form of sapientia and she is referred to by solomon as a woman as well throughout that text now that we've looked at the motto and the epigram, let's take a listen to the fugue for Emblem 26 as transcribed and interpreted by my dear friend Tomash. Take it away, Tomash. Thank you, Tomash, for your most excellent performance of the Fugue from Emblem 26. Is there anything that you can't do? <laughs> I think you'll all agree. He's unbelievable. Okay, uh, now, of course, you know, we're going to be hearing more from Tomash a little later on in his interpretation of Emblem 26. It's really, really interesting, as always. So now, let's take a look at Donna Belak's discovery concerning Emblem 26 and its pivotal role in 
Atlantophugians. Donna Belak, the hermetic scholar and goldsmith, has made some astonishing discoveries concerning this emblem. And it's gonna blow your mind, truly, because it's multi-dimensional and multi-layered, even more than we could possibly have imagined when we began looking at this book. Now, speaking of Sapientia's hands, Donna realized that the, the right palm is facing upward to the divine light and the left palm is facing downward to the roots of the tree of life. So she essentially is the bridge between heaven and earth. Donna calls it the, the bridge between divine inspiration and earthly product, right? So, and look who we have here. This is Theodora, all right? Say hi to everybody, Theodora. She hates being picked up, but anyway, this is how she doesn't look very thrilled, but uh, let's put her down and let her be on her way. Love you, sweetheart. There you go. All right. Anyway, uh, now before the Hermetic Journeys team takes a crack at this, I'd like to show you an, an excerpt from uh, an interview I did with Donna Bielak some time ago. Now, where she reveals what this is all about and how important this emblem is in the overall construct of Atalantifugians. So, so not only is Sapientia, the emblem uh, Sapientia, the bridge between divine, uh, divine inspiration and, and the earthly product, okay, she's also the center point of Atalantifugians. Well, how could she be? She's emblem 26. It should be emblem 25, right? Okay, if we're looking at 50 emblems are we? This is really cool. And this is all Donna's discovery. And this is absolutely brilliant. Now, um, and she's going to explain it to you. I'm going to, I'm going to lay out the foundation here. Okay. Because like the alchemical process, the book itself transforms into something. Now to give you some background to those of you who have not watched Hermetic Journeys from the very beginning, emblems number one and two were sort of like two sides of the same coin. Why? Because the mottos of each of those emblems come from an ancient document. I'll tell you the, the, the mythology behind it. It's, it's called the Emerald Tablet, or in Latin, the Tabula Smaragdina. And it was supposedly written by Thoth, the Egyptian Netter god, Thoth, and then adopted later on when the Greeks took over and they took the Egyptian gods and made them their own, Hermes Trismegistus, probably heard Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus, right? That name possibly. In any case, that is what, uh, that, that is where this document is supposed to have come from, right? Now, now let's take a quick look at emblem number one. As you can see, there's a, a man here with, with fumes coming out of his head and his, and his extremities, and he's got a little baby in his stomach. Well, this is it's quite an emblem. Essentially, the long and the short of it is, he represents mercury, hence the fumes. Then the little baby inside him represents sulfur, right? So it's the sulfur baby, or the sulfur is the fire, the, the internal fire of the alchemical process. And this, the motto for this particular emblem is, the wind carried it in its belly. Now, emblem number two depicts a woman as Mother Earth nurturing a child, right? Well, this child is the philosophical child. It is the philosopher's stone because all of the ingredients that come to create the philosopher's stone come from the internals of the earth, come from Mother Earth. And that, that motto states, the earth is its nurse. Now, I'm going to read to you a tiny section of the of this document, the Emerald Tablet, uh, that Isaac Newton translated, all right, because Isaac Newton was an alchemist and he spent more time writing about alchemy than he did about physics, <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't know. But in any case, here's that little excerpt to give you some context as to where these, these mottos came from. Tis true without lying, certain and most true. That which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below, to do ye miracles of one only thing. The sun is its father, the moon is its mother. The wind hath carried it in its belly, the earth its nurse. Okay, so there's the two phrases from the Emerald Tablet. Now, one more thing <laughs> before we get to Donna. She realized something about the first page of Atalanta Fugians, all right? It's called the frontispiece, and on the first page, it's to, it says something really, really strange. I'm gonna read you a little bit of it and get to that point, All right, Here we go. Accommodating partly to the eyes and understanding with figures cut in copper, 
and that's the, the copper plates that Matthias Marian used to create these images, and sentences, epigrams, and notes added partly to the ears and recreation of the mind, there are more or less 50 musical flights of three voices. What? More or less? What does that mean? I don't know, I count 50 emblems on both books that I've got, right? How could there be more or less 50 emblems? Well, <laughs> this goes to show you how, how sharp Donna is, because in some translations, it's left out. More or less is left out because it doesn't make any sense, right? But it does if you know what's going on. And Donna picked up on this. And here's the original frontispiece frontis in Latin. And it says here, right there, you can see plus, minus, 50, fugis, etc. Plus, minus, plus or minus, 50. More or less, plus or minus. What does this all mean? I'm going to let Donna explain this to you right now. Here we go. I happened to encounter Atalanta Fugians in a random, when I was supposed to be doing something else, I got sidetracked, sparked <laughs> my interest, decided to go to a library in a different state and city um, to see the book. Uh, then several months or even a couple of years later, I was at another history of science conference. And randomly, I decided to go to a session on uh, Benjamin Franklin's magic squares. I had no idea what a magic square was, but it was just like, oh, cool, yeah. magic. And then like within the first few minutes, I'm subjected to like, you know, really advanced mathematics. And I can't <laughs> I'm in the middle of the room and I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so bombarded with it. But that introduced me to the concept of a magic square. And then I find myself a few years after that at the Science History Institute, which was then known as Chemical Heritage Foundation. I had finished my dissertation on John Allen and my first postdoc turned out to be to explore Atalanta Fugians because I knew there was something funny about this book. I knew in the mm -hmm. title page, you know, that reference plus minus there are more or less 50 emblems no there are 50 emblems what's this more or less and plus minus is something that most of the translators just completely uh delete from the translations and for me oh. that was like critical and i understood there was also something funny happening about emblems one and two and i understood that i understood implicitly based on the latin and based on the fact that they were two precepts taken from the emerald tablet mashed together but separated that to me was the plus minus. So 50 somehow equals 49. So I got a postdoc to basically figure out how 50 equals 49. <laughs> and I had to give a presentation um, oh as part of the postdoc. Uh, and to explain this concept of how these, how by bringing together emblems one and two reshuffles everything. I organized obsessively in thumbnails uh, on my PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and the way it was organized, um, somebody commented in the audience, this looks mathematical. And then I thought, this actually looks like a magic square. It was, wow. Oh. Like there, it was really unscientific, actually, how I started to reframe my approach to Atalanta Fugians. Now let's take a look at an excerpt from the presentation that Donna did concerning the magic square and Atalanta Fugians. Because there's another deeper layer to this emblem book beneath that which meets our eye. Buckle up, things are about to get really cool here. <coughs> so recall that emblems one and two constitute two halves of a whole, creating a single unit, like two faces of a coin. Thus, Atalanta is reordered in from 50 to 49 fugue emblem sets. And uh, this shift in numbers is signposted by the reference to the, in the title page to more or less 50 fugue emblem sets plus minus. And note that this shift from 50 to 49, emblem 26 is transformed into emblem 25. So she is still, Sapientia is still at the center of the work. And this is significant because Sapientia forms our bridge into Atalanta's reconfiguration as a uh, seven by seven magic square. The term for a mathematical puzzle that's comprised of a square grid of numbered cells whose rows, columns, and diagonals all add up to the same value. And in a seven by seven magic square, it's 175. So all of the columns, all of the rows, and both diagonals 
when you add up the numbers, they come to 175. Nor is the Atalantifugians any old 7 by 7 magic square. There are actually thousands of possible constructions. It's a very particular magic square. It is the magic square of Venus. Yes. And how do we know this? It's based on the 16th century work, De Occulta Philosophia, um, De Occulta Philosophia by Henricia Cornelius Agrippa von Nettesheim, who tabulated magic squares for each of the seven planets. And this is actually the 1535 edition from the um, Columbia University Special Collections in the Health Sciences Library. So, looking <laughs> at chemical and the Atalantifugians morphs into a magic square dedicated to Venus, the goddess of love, who is also consort of Vulcan, god of fortune, fire, and the alchemist tool of transformation. And in the magic square version, we get these very interesting pairings that happen that are governed by the algorithm, uh, which determines the uh, um, ordering of the numbers. So this is something that we've been exploring with um, Robin Beer and Grand Beer, who are directors of the Solo Voice Ensemble, Les Canaires Chantons, and exploring ways in which you can interpret and explore the book, both musically, textually, and iconographically, through this hidden version of uh, the book. The book is essentially a game that the reader is meant to apprehend the clues to, which are scattered throughout the book, in the music, text, and image. When you gather all the clues and you recognize that Sathgientia is the portal into the magic square, you then enter into this hidden realm where you can play and experience the book in a whole completely new way. It's thank you so much, Donna. And thank you to Brown University and Tara Numadal for allowing us to show the footage and, uh, and, and also for the interview. Thank I want to explain one more thing before I hand it over to the team. And that is, what is a magic square? What the heck is a magic square? Well, today, you know, we look at numbers as um, ca mere calculations, right? We want to make sure we're not paying too much interest, and we're getting the proper discount, right? Or we're paying the right amount of money, whatever it is. So it, it all really, today it's become very sterilized, okay? But uh, uh, some time ago, during Michael Myers' time, and certainly before then, the ancient Greeks and the Egyptians, numbers were sacred. They had, they had, in, they had meaning and purpose. What is a magic square? Well, a magic square, as, as Donna talked about earlier, is uh, it's kind of like mathematical musings, where horizontal, vertical, and diagonal have to add up to the same number, right? Which is pretty, pretty cool to begin with. So how does one go about creating a magic square, or using a magic square? What is the purpose? Well, on the more conventional side, mathematicians have been using magic squares for a long, long time, right? Some of them are just mathematical musings, as Donna spoke about. Some of them are used to create code machines, things like that. Um, so it's very complex. The magic square has, it has many uses in many different disciplines, all right? Now, in the more unconventional sense, which of course what we here at Hermetic Journey are intrinsically interested in, all right, magic squares can be used by people to get what they want. What does that mean? Well, first let's take a look at how to create a magic square. And this is the simplest magic square. It is the magic square for the planet Saturn. So the first thing we have to do is create a five by five grid. All right, and then we're gonna, we're gonna bring create the magic square, which is gonna be on a three by three, three grid. And you'll see why we're doing a five by five grid. Now, the way we create the magic square for the planet Saturn is to lay out diagonals of the numbers one through nine, because it's a three by three magic square. Now, we're gonna take the first diagonal outside the square on the top right corner of the square, one, two, and three. Then we're gonna use the diagonal directly within the square for four, five, and six. And then we're gonna use the diagonal outside the square again on the opposite side, seven, eight, and nine. You'll notice that there are numbers that fall outside the square. We need to move those to the opposite side of the square. So we're gonna go through the sequence of moving these numbers from the outside back to the inside of the square. Now, why are we doing this? Remember, it's really important that one of the, one of the rules of the magic square is that all the numbers, horizontally, vertically, and diagonally, all add up to the number 15. And as you can see, by moving these numbers to the opposite sides of where they reside outside the square creates the number 15. We get the sum of 15 on the, all the diagonals and the horizontal and verticals. So now we have this magic square with a group of numbers. 
what we're going to do next is we need to trace out sequentially the numbers, all right? So we're going to go from 1 to 3. Then we're going to go from 4 to 6. And then from 7 to 9. Now, what we created here is something called a sigil. Now, a sigil is like a symbol, okay? Only it's called a sigil because it has some magical aspect to it. Because what you're supposed to do is as you're creating the magic square, specifically the Saturn magic square, you want to create it when Saturn is in the sky at a particular point, time of, time of year, where its, it's, it's energies are most uh, auspicious, okay? So this is a little astrology here and some magic and occult stuff, so don't get nervous. Uh, anyway, so you can see how these how these symbols become imbued with the powers of the planets, with the energies of the planets, okay? This is how it's supposed to work. The other part of it is, as you're creating the magic square, you want to put that intent into that sigil, into that symbol, all right? Now, why are we using, why don't, you, why don't you just think about the magic square, the numbers in the magic square, and why do we have to create the symbol? Well, because... You want this, we want this, the symbol to be in, embedded into your subconscious mind, not your conscious mind, because your conscious mind has doubt mechanisms, okay? So if you want to attain something through the magic square, through this symbol, all right, you want to get something, you know, you want to get a, a job or something, or whatever it is, whatever you're trying to attain, you ascribe this, this particular sigil from the magic square to that particular energy. That's the idea, okay? It's interesting, isn't it? Now we get back to Earth here. Interestingly, you see the sigil that is that we created for the planet Saturn is also one of the symbols for lead, which is the the metal that is associated with Saturn, right? Saturn is associated with lead. We talked about this in previous videos. And that is one of the many symbols for lead. And as you can see in this particular chart, there it is, right? That's a symbol for, there are many symbols for lead. Now, here's an example of a more complex, very complex. See, once you get past the three by three magic square, it gets really complicated because of the many variations. There's tens of thousands, and then it gets into the millions when you get into the really complex magic squares. So remember, Donna said this was a seven by seven magic square, which represented the Venus square for Adelina Fugians. And here it is. And the sigil, as you can see, that was derived from the magic square is the symbol for copper. Okay, one of the symbols for copper. Now what's cool about this symbol that copper is, is associated with Venus alchemically is that Matthias Marion etched all of these emblems on copper plates. So there's this, again, you see this, these layers of correspondences. Really, really cool stuff. Once you figure it all out, right? Now, whew, let's let the Hermetic Journeys team take a crack at this. Take it away, guys. Pelicans! My gosh, there's pelicans. No hummingbirds. We did see some pelicans though. That was cool. Hey there, Tony. Hey there, Hermetic Journeys family. What up, Internet? How y'all? Jake the dog, Nathan the human. Here was some Emblem 26 musings. So yeah. Oh, there we go. Hummingbirds. Much like pelicans, except much smaller and very different than pelicans. Similar to all things that we talk about in these things. All very similar. Very different. And the nectar. The nectar of it all. Let's get to it, shall we? Health and wealth. Wealth. Um, Buckminster Fuller defines wealth as a third thing. Something that emerges from the synergy. The synergy. Yes, Buckminster Fuller. Synergy. Something that from the combined efforts, no, not a corporate buzzword, a totally proactive corporate buzzword to maximize productivity, but rather something that is, um, we share, you know, wealth is shared, it's not hoarded. And like the alchemical processes, it's two seeping separate things given the right conditions, the right terrain, the right environment, we end up with some new stuff. Have you ever seen a hummingbird poop? It's fascinating, it's just a little spray. I just saw it now. Nature is wonderful. But yeah, wealth, 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 wealth. A wealth of knowledge in these emblems. Let's talk about how they tie in a little bit, just like the alchemical process. They, they work together. Check out her blouse, AKA gendered shirt. 
Um, it's the armor, like the bottom of the armor of the guy with the club from many emblems ago. Um, all ties in, you know, the masculine and the feminine principles. In the same way that we see the female character with quite the male face, make somewhat of a male triangle, if you will. And it has peaks, almost like an evergreen tree, if you will, like a Christmas tree, um, a conifer, an evergreen, something different than the, quote, other tree, maybe of knowledge that sits to the right. The motto kind of speaks a little bit um, against Genesis, doesn't it? The tree of life is the fruit of human wisdom. Human wisdom, huh? A little bit of an oxymoron, like a jumbo shrimp or military intelligence, right? Wisdom as the man thing, really, really? Sophia, you know, the female aspect? Hold on, there's another hummingbird. We can probably get him. Super cool. California, it is everything. There's another one. Guys, feed your hummingbirds. It's so fun. It's It just doesn't stop, but I digress. The tree. Um, woman as the tree of life. Yeah, so cool. And how about that? Like, it's a stable thing. The, the woman, the stable element that is acted upon by the male, the masculine, the mover to create the third thing. The two with the pregnant, you know, with the inevitable three that which will emerge. And yet there's a bash of chaos in that, isn't there? Like birth. You never know what you're going to get with the kid, you know? Um, the man and the woman come together to make the third thing. And that third thing is an element kind of chaos, which is not to be feared. Chaos is the dance. It's the movement within, you know, the confines of the, the monad. It's the dancer there that we're all with. You know, Shiva destroying and creating with every new breath as God moves from glory to glory and the angels sing in the endless hallelujah and all that stuff. Pretty neat. What else do we got? We have notes. Today's a little longer, guys. That's pretty much it. All right. Well, it was fun. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Tony. Hope everybody's having a great 2024. Um, be gentle with yourselves. You know, much like the alchemical process, it flows seamlessly into each other, guided by our steady hand, you know. Human wisdom, if you will. I think the ultimate wisdom is to embrace a little bit of that silence and listen to what it has to say to us and smile if you can be good deuces thank you nathan and jake for your most patently unique interpretation of emblem 26 always a pleasure and it's great to see you too jake oh man i wish i could pet you <laughs> okay so now uh let's have a look at what steve kalik our resident alchemist has to say about emblem 26 and its alchemical interpretation take it away my dear friend steve hello tony my good friend and greetings to all your followers well this emblem in its simplicity is a most favorite of mine i say simplicity because at first reading it is quite simple to the non-initiated eyes but with careful attention, it speaks volumes. Michael Meyer expresses that man, having the ability to express reason, excels all creatures. He says that reason comes from the divine breath. Well, in Genesis, we read that God breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Meyer tells us that reason is an intellectual virtue and that wisdom springs from the proper use and application of reason and that wisdom is the most precious thing a man can obtain. But what is wisdom? In our emblem we are made to understand that the fruits of human wisdom is from the tree of life, as Sophia. She promises us that those who seek after her and are in love with her, will receive health and length of days on one hand, and glory and riches on the other. Michael Meyer tells us that those who diligently acquire after her shall receive much joy, for she is the tree of life, and the wise shall inherit glory. Well, I cannot help here but bring reference to an ancient hermetic text, the Golden Tractates of Hermes. There is a passage where the Philosopher's Stone declares to man the following, and I shall read this. 
It says, understand, now this is the philosopher's stone declaring this. Understand then, O son of wisdom, what the stone declares. Protect me, and I will protect thee. Increase my strength, and I will help thee. My soul and my beams are most inwardly and secretly in my own luna. My soul is the solar light. My own luna is the reflective faculty within, within each and every one of us. It continues to say, My light exceeding every light, and my good things are better, better than all other good things. I give freely and I reward the intelligent with joy and gladness, glory, riches, delights. And them that seek after me, I will make to know and understand and possess divine things. Well, those who seek after me, that's all you need, is to seek. And you shall be given all these things. Well, this brings us to, to the New Testament where Jesus said to the Apostles, Seek ye the kingdom of heaven first, and all these shall be added unto you. Now, wisdom, Sophia also declares, those who seek me. Now this is something that you should dwell on. We should all dwell on this. Well, how uncanny are these ancient hermetic literatures? One book opens another book. The words of one master reveals the words of another. Both texts reveal that the Philosopher's Stone is spiritual intellectual wisdom. Wisdom is a spiritual light, which awakens the dormant higher faculties of the soul and gifts their possessors with a new enhanced consciousness and enlarged perspective faculty. As one's consciousness thus expands, he exteriorizes it. He projects it onto the world and transforms his world as his reality and his perspective of it has changed. This is the art of transmutation. The Philosopher's Stone is here revealed to us in this emblem as being the attainment of wisdom. But wisdom does not come without reason. And reason does not come without knowledge. Reason, we are told, excels humans from animals and lesser creatures. Well, the spider still spins its web as it did a million years ago. And the bear still lives in the cave or his den as it did since ever. However, man has built the seven wonders of the world and has measured the heavens because of knowledge. Now in Genesis, we are told that there was a tree called the tree of knowledge of good and evil, allegorical garden of Eden. To the keen understanding, it is realized here that we are told that there is no knowledge of good and evil without knowing both. How would we be able to discern? To know good, evil also will be known, and vice versa. Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of this tree. They realized their nakedness, they felt shame, which allegorically reveals to us that man at a certain point in his evolution had attained self-consciousness, and so conscience was born. With conscience we have lost our innocence. We are now responsible for all our actions and all the consequences that come with it. So we have lost paradise. But we have gained consciousness. However, knowledge is not wisdom and most often is misinterpreted for wisdom. We have often heard the term, he is a wise man since he is so knowledgeable. Knowledge and wisdom, though they are related, they are two different qualities. Knowledge without wisdom is not perfection. As an example, knowledge led man to master the atomic theory, but without wisdom it also led them to create the atom bomb. Wisdom therefore is Sophia and the tree of life. 
And we must now eat of the tree of life, since we've eaten of the tree of knowledge. And those who seek to attain her shall also attain eternity, and they shall be given great delight. As the Philosopher's Stone promises in the Golden Tractates of Hermes, they shall be rewarded with intelligence, joy, gladness, glory, riches, and delights, and them that seek after me, they shall be made to know and understand and possess divine things. Well, my friends, having said all that, I can say no more. I'm finished. So, I'm wishing you all the best, and goodbye for now. Thank you, Steve, for your deeply profound interpretation of this emblem. I mean, it's just such a beautiful, it's poetry, my friend, poetry, as always. And now, last but certainly not least, let's have a listen and see what Tomash has to say about Emblem 26. And this is really, really interesting, folks, so stay tuned. Take it away, Tomash. Greetings to all Hermetic Journeys viewers. In my contribution, I will talk about only one of the motifs of the Discourse of Emblem 26, which I identify as something that is called Universality in Advaita. Directly in the first sentence, Michael Meyer writes that the main difference between human beings and animals is intelligence. Then he states that this intelligence does not originate from the earth, but from the heavens having a divine origin. The reason why I think that these sentences describe universality is because in another book of Dr. Meyer, in the Arcana Arcanissima, he refers to this motif in a more direct way. But before discussing that text, let us first hear from Francis Lucille what the universality of consciousness means in Advaita. That which is hearing these words, these words in this moment, is not a separate individual, but is a universal consciousness. What evidence do we have that there are as many consciousnesses as there are minds, or as there are bodies, or body minds? The evidence is that each person doesn't perceive what all the other individuals seem to be perceiving. Let's take a, the analogy of a tower, a circular tower, with all kinds of windows looking at a landscape. Each window the landscape that appears in each window is different. Does the fact that the six landscapes that appear in the six windows are different imply that there are six observers in the tower? So in this metaphor, the, each mind or each body mind is a window and consciousness is the observer. In the first book of the Arcana Arcanissima, Dr. Meyer mostly analyzed texts from the Bibliotheca Historica written by Diodorus Siculus, a Greek historian who lived in the 1st century BC. His main source for this analysis was the Latin translation of the Bibliotheca from the Greek original, which was published in 1559 in Basel. Dr. Meyer copied large parts over from that text and only shortened the sentences in some cases. Among many mythological stories, he discusses the myth of Osiris, who was cut into 26 pieces by his brother Typhon, who scattered the parts all over Egypt. Harogan! Then the wife of Osiris, Isis, collected all the parts and made the body whole. Then she created many statues out of wax and spices in the likeness of Osiris, then buried the real body at a secret location. She summoned all priests from all over Egypt and talked to each family one by one. 
She gave each a wax figure and pretended that it is the real body of Osiris. Then she made them swore an oath that they won't tell anyone that the body is in their possession and will honor it regularly with rites. Dr. Meyer gives the following comment to the story. Indeed, if the Egyptian priests who have the image of Osiris are the only ones to know about his tomb and allege that it is in their house, yet would not make it available to anyone, then that shows nothing else but what they confess, yet allegorically, that they are knowers and possessors of the alchemical art, which they would not reveal to anyone but only to those who are worthy of it. Thank you, Tomas, for your contribution to this emblem. It's always, always so interesting. And again, thank you for your interpretation of the fugue as well. It's fantastic. Well, I hope you guys have all enjoyed uh, this particular emblem. I have thanks to many people, to Anna, my daughter, for singing in the introduction. Thank you to uh, Donna Bielak, of course, Tara Numadal, and the Brown University Library for allowing us to use footage from Donna and Tara's presentation on Atlanta Fugians. And of course, thank you to Nathan and Jake. Love you guys. And of course, Steve Kalick, our alchemist pal, and uh, to everybody else. And uh, unfortunately, Maddie was unable to uh, to co uh, contribute to this particular emblem, but she'll be back for those of, you, you know, those of you Maddie fans, and there's a lot of them. In any case, thank you very, very much, guys, for watching. Remember uh, to, uh, to subscribe and to like. And also remember, we have the Hermetic Journeys merch, right? Hermeticjourneys.com slash merch. Check some of that out, right? So you can wear wonderful t-shirts like this and other things. Uh, thanks again for watching. And uh, we will see you next time for Emblem 27. Real excited already. We're excited about Emblem 27. Be safe, have a great time, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you.